Let's take our Bibles, if you have your Bible this morning. Let's open up to Psalm 103. Psalm 103, we'll just read a verse and then we'll have prayer and get into the message here. Psalm 103. Psalm 103 and verse number 13. Psalm 103, verse number 13. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that feareth him. Notice verse 13, like as a father. I want to preach some on our heavenly father. Aren't you glad God is a good father? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Brother Jeff Kennedy, we ask the Lord to bless the message for us. The Lord, we're so thankful. Amen. Thank you so much. Our Father is a good Heavenly Father. And you know, I'd like to give you some things about that this morning, but before I do, I ran across a few things. Uh, this is somebody had written this, our estimation of our Father through the years. Four years old, my daddy knows everything. Eight years old, my daddy is really smart. Twelve years old, my dad probably doesn't know that. 16 years old, my dad is clueless. 21 years old, dad is pretty much out of touch. 30 years old, I'd like to find out what dad thinks about this. 40 years old, let's get dad's opinion before we make a decision. 50 years old, I wish I could ask my dad about that. He's pretty smart. 60 years old, my, my dad knew almost everything. It's funny how your estimation of your dad changes through the years as you grow up and as you grow through things. And as children, you realize your parents knew a whole lot more than you gave them credit for. And the older we get, the more we begin to see those things. But I think as Christians, the more we grow and mature in Jesus Christ, we should go, grow more and appreciative of our Heavenly Father and how wise and how good He is. Here's another thing I'd like to read you. Paul Harvey, the old common radio commentator, he said, A father is a thing that is forced to endure childbirth without an anesthetic. <laughs> Big deal, huh? <laughs> a father is a thing that growls when it feels good and laughs very loud when it's scared half to death. A father never feels entirely worthy of the worship in his child's eyes. He's never quite the hero his daughter thinks, never quite the man his son believes him to be, and this worries him sometimes. So he works too hard to try and smooth the rough places in the road for those of his own who will follow him. A father is a thing that gets very angry when the first school graders aren't as good as he thinks they should be. First school grades, rather. He scolds his son, though he knows it's the teacher's fault. Now, we need to get back to that. Now, the teacher gets bawled out, and the police officer gets yelled at, and the authorities get yelled at. Uh, by the way, if you're, if you're in a bad place, you might run into an authority figure that might have had a bad day. But if you're not in a bad spot, you don't even have any danger of running into somebody that's having a bad day. Just saying. He scolds his son, though he knows it's the teacher's fault. Fathers are what give daughters away to other men who aren't nearly good enough so they can have grandchildren who are smarter than anybody's. <laughs> All right. Now, in Proverbs, or in Psalms 25, verse 8, the Bible says, Good and upright is the Lord. And here we read, As a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. So God is a father to us. We know that he's our father. That's the prayer, right? 
our Father which art in heaven. But also we know in Paul's epistles, Paul refers to the Lord, not only the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, but our Father, God as our Father. And so we know that God's our Father and we know that God is good. We call that the omnibenevolence of God. God is not only good, but God is omniscient. He knows everything. He's, uh, then you have the omnisapience of God. That has to do with God's wisdom. He's all wise about all things. He is all knowledgeable about all things. He's all powerful. So God has all the power to do things for his children, but he also has all the wisdom. So not only can he do what's possible for us, he can do what's best for us, but he also does what's moral for us because he's good. And God has to be good in everything he does. So when we think about God this morning, we're going to think about a few things and turn to a few scriptures. I want you to realize that our Heavenly Father is a good God. And sometimes out in the world when you deal with uh, scientists and secular and atheists and philosophers, they try to portray the God of the Bible as some uh, 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 demagogue, some type of mean uh, tribal God that kills people and this kind of thing. God does take vengeance and God is jealous, but God is holy and God is pure and God is just. And God is good. The Bible says God is love. So when God makes a decision and he does something, it's always the right decision. You never have to question what God does in your life as your heavenly father. He will always do what's right for you. We know from Romans chapter number 8, all things work together for good. All things work together for our good and for his glory. So take your Bible. Let's look at a few places this morning. Go to Deuteronomy chapter number 5. Deuteronomy chapter number 5. The first thing I'd like to say about God is God's wishes for us. God's wishes. I'm sure you parents and you dads, you think about your kids and you maybe have some dreams and aspirations for them and you think, oh yeah, when he gets big enough, he's going to play t-ball. Or he gets big enough, he's going to play basketball. You know, he's going to be tall so he can dunk them. You know, or he's going to do such and such. Or he's going to, you know, be a great, um, a, a great poet, right? That's what you want your son to be, a great poet, yeah. Uh, no, man, you're thinking, okay, this is what he's going to do. One day she's going to grow up and she's going to get married and she's going to be beautiful and she's going to be successful. You have all these things, all these wishes, all these desires. But on a moral perspective... I'm sure that you parents in here and you dads, you look at your kids and you want them to grow up and love God. You want to see them reading the Bible on their own. You want to see them memorizing Bible verses on their own. You want to see them singing some psalms and hymns and spirit. You have wishes, you have desires, you have dreams for them for their good. You're not thinking bad about your kids. You don't want anything bad to happen to your children. Why would we think God does things to us to hurt us? God has good wishes for us. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 5 as we think about the nation of Israel here. And you know this is the second giving of the law. And Moses is going back over some things here in this passage. And he goes through and talks about the covenant. And obviously this is with the nation of Israel. Come down if you will. Uh, let's just come toward the end of the chapter. Verse number 28. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spake unto me. And the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. Look in verse 29. That first word. Oh. Oh. That there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always. That it might be well with them and with their children forever. He says, Oh. You see that several times in the Bible, over in chapter 33, he says, Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this. In Isaiah 48, 18, he says, Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. Uh, Psalm 81, 13, Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me. That's his wishes, that's his, his desire. It's a cry that God is making. He says, Oh, I wish they would listen to me. He says, oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me. You know, God's wish for us is that we would fear him properly. 
You know, here's the thing about the Lord. The Lord desires that you and I would be good children because He wants to bless us. He wants things to be well with us. He wants us to uh, be joyful in our life. He wants us to have fellowship with Him. He wants us to be able to enjoy His presence. He desires that. I never forget Brother Knowles. I think it might have been him preaching here or somewhere else. He was preaching on the judgment seat of Christ, and he said, you know, God and the Lord Jesus Christ wants you to do well with the judgment seat of Christ. And oftentimes we picture, we picture the judgment seat of Christ as this horrible thing, which there's going to be some terror there, believe me. I mean, all your works are going to be tried. And nothing's going to be uncovered. And everything you've done in the body, whether it be good or bad, will be revealed. You will give account to Him. That's going to be a scary time. I'm just going to follow my face and say, I'm guilty, Lord. But think about it. If He's given out rewards, if He's given out trophies, He wants to reward His children. Much like dads want to see their kids do well, much like parents want to see their kids succeed, the Lord looks at us and He wants us to do right. And I think that oftentimes we don't see that side of God. We just see Him maybe in the sense of Him getting on to us, although He will and He does that. But God has these wishes. He has these plans. One of the tragedies of the life of Samson, when I think about him, and I think about an epitaph for Samson on his tomb, he said, well, Samson was a great man. He killed a lot of people. He did all this stuff. Yeah, but Samson got in trouble with the flesh, he got in trouble with all of these things he shouldn't have done. Think about what he could have done had he yielded to God. I think the epitaph on that tomb for Samson might read, it could have been different. I mean, Samson committed suicide, for crying out loud. At the end of his life, that's what he did. And he could have been a great general, a great leader. It could have been different. I think God looks at us and he sees our life and he has these plans. He has this prosperity, not necessarily materially, but he wants us to have fellowship with him. There are some blessings and benefits he wants to give us and he wants us to experience the joy of our salvation. And we don't see that. We just see God as having to get on to us all the time. They did some research years ago, some family life specialists and... They had uh, did some research regarding what children most hear from their parents at a young age. Number one, they hear, I'm too tired. Number two, we don't have enough money. And number three, keep quiet. <laughs> Those are the three main things that a lot of kids hear. They just hear the negative. They just hear, you're bothering me. They don't see, oftentimes that there's a wish, there's a desire, there's a joy that they anticipate for that child. And I think we look at God that way oftentimes. Oh, that they were wise, he says. Oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me. God has good wishes for you. He wants you to do well. He wants you to love God and serve God. You kids in here, He wants you to grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He wants you to get closer to Him. He wants you to be successful for Him. He desires that. And then next, I want us to talk about some of the warnings. We don't really have to turn to any of them. You can see them right here in the text in Deuteronomy chapter 20, chapter 5 here. If you go through the whole thing, he, go, he, he goes through the commandments here. You'll notice verse number 11, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Number t verse 12, Keep the Sabbath day. All these commandments, the Ten Commandments, are here in the passage. But God not only wishes some things for us, but God warns us. I think about Genesis with Adam and Eve. Here's the father with his kids. What does he do? Immediately, he warns Adam of the danger. You see, sin was already in the universe by the devil. The devil sinned before Adam ever sinned. And so there was that tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden, and God warned Adam to stay away from that tree. 
Now, he didn't warn Adam because he was trying to keep something back from him, although that's what the devil implied. Remember when the devil talked to Eve? He's like, well, you know, God just knows that when you eat that tree, you're going to be wiser and you're going to be more educated and you're going to take a step up. God's holding you back. God's not letting you have some of this knowledge and see some of these things and experience some of these things because he just, he's just holding this back from you. God is really not as good as you think he is. That's what's implied behind that temptation. But God gives us a warning not to hurt us, but to help us. Thou shalt not. Sounds very forceful, very negative, but a warning is supposed to be that way. Stay away from the stove. Don't touch it. Get your finger out of the plug. <laughs> Don't lick that. It's Gorilla Glue. Do not eat Gorilla Glue. You'll be going to the dentist. <laughs> warnings are hard sometimes. And sometimes warnings cut to the chase and they're very, they're very specific. But, you know, we need that. And parents in here, I know you probably, it wears on the kids sometimes and it wears on you, but you have to warn them. We have maverick moms and delinquent dads now who will not take the discipline and the time and the effort to literally train children. And from what I observe watching some of you, it's a full-time job. You could just put them in front of a TV and plug their ears full of something and not deal with it, I guess, but to really stay on top of things and warn them and show them and help them, it takes work. Somebody said, we spend the first six years teaching our children to walk and talk and the next 15 telling them to shut up and sit down. <laughs> oh, look, they're talking, look, they're talking. They're never going to stop. Warnings. Sometimes we take those warnings in the wrong way. We need to realize God loves us, so he warns us. And the Holy Spirit of God convicts you of something and he gets on you and you're supposed to feel bad about doing wrong. We've got this idea that everybody's so thin-skinned about everything nowadays. You see it in our culture. But this idea of being offended, everybody's offended. You say, what's wrong? They're so scarred up with sin, they can't take a rebuke. They're so scarred up with sin, they don't want to admit they're wrong. And there is something very healthy about a conscience. And I'll tell you something even better than that is a clean, clear conscience. When the Holy Spirit convicts you of something wrong and God gives you a warning... Heed God's warning. If you've messed up, confess up and get things right. And then when the Holy Spirit warns you, realize, okay, he's kind of guiding me. There's some, uh, you know, why should we have, you know, these, these things on the side of the bridges there? You know, isn't that kind of, uh, you know, that's kind of an infringement on my rights to have those things there because they're telling me I can't go on the other side of those. <laughs> well, help yourself. Just drive off on the other side of those things. And see what's going to happen to you. The warnings are there for our well-being. He has good wishes for us. He has warnings for us. Turn over to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter number 12. And sometimes he has to whip us. Hebrews chapter 12. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, when Moses goes back through some of these things regarding the journeys through the wilderness, he makes this statement, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasten thee. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God. In other words, God took Israel as his son. And if he took that responsibility upon him, he would have to warn him. And then, on occasion, he would have to whip him. Because sometimes a tongue lashing is not enough. There has to be something that gets the attention of the child. And so here in Hebrews chapter number 12, he goes through this idea of chastening. Come down in Hebrews chapter number 12 in verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children... My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. 
So two things can happen when you are whipped by God. You can despise it. You can turn into a scorner. You can be rebellious. You can, uh, you know, just get bitter at it. And it can upset you. Then, Or you can faint. It can, it can put you out of the race. Some people get chastened by God and they quit. And they quit on God. They just take the Bible. They just discard it. They discard any of their training, biblical training. They discard what God's trying to teach them and they faint. They quit. Verse number 6. For whom the Lord, look at this, loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If God did not love you, he would just let you go. I mean, you think sometimes about, uh, here's, let's say here's a dad and here's his son. They're out there playing ball in the road, and maybe they live on a busy street, and the ball run, goes out in the road, and the son runs out in the road without even looking, and it's a fairly busy street, and grabs the ball, and he knows he's not supposed to do that. The father gets all over him for that. Tears his hind end up. You say, Why? Because he wants that son to know he shouldn't run into the road. Very simple illustration. But it's because of the father's love that he's willing to have his son even get upset at him. And by the way, a father doesn't have to be the best friend of the child. And I know God is, a, is everything to us. He's, our, he's a friend that's thick of closer than a brother. I'm not taking that aspect away from the Lord. But God's God. But understand, listen to me, when God whips you, He's not whipping you because He's mean or mad. He's whipping you because He loves you. And He wants to get your attention. And we are some knuckle-headed kids. I am a knuckle-headed kid and so are you. Hard-headed, knuckle-headed. And it takes God doing some things in our life sometimes to get our attention. And he does that because he loves us. Notice the text here, verse number 7. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. What son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. So here's one thing. When you get punished and you get whipped by the Lord, you have to realize and understand that God is punishing you because he loves you. And if he did not punish you, then you wouldn't be his child. So when we have chastisement, when God does some things in our lives, we have to realize that this is a good sign, this is a good thing, because I know God's given me attention. Now, it might not be the attention I want. But you know, sometimes kids, they'll act out of sorts, and they're screaming out for attention, even if it's having to get in trouble all the time. And they're getting that attention. God will give you attention. But you have to realize and understand when He punishes us and He chastens us, He does it because He loves us. And if you were not His child, He would not chasten you. So notice that. Continue to read verse number 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, Hebrews 12 verse 9, which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. You know, sometimes our earthly parents, they do get in the flesh. Amen? I'm sure your father and my father uh, sometimes maybe got mad, and that's the reason they punished us, because they wanted to watch the game and we were running in front of the TV, or whatever the thing may be. Or you're in the grocery store acting like a crazy person, and they're like, you are embarrassing me. I'm about to whip you because I'm disciplined. No, because you're embarrassed. <laughs> and the reason sometimes it's, it's wrong, oftentimes, I'm sure that has happened. But God is perfect. God is sinless. God never just makes a mistake and slaps one of his children. He never gets aggravated and, and slaps one of his kids. The Lord chastens us and brings us into subjection because he loves us. You've got to understand that. Notice in verse number 11, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. I can't ever remember a time when I was a kid 
and I was whipped by my father and spanked and punished, whatever you want to call it. We didn't have time out when I was growing up. Time out when I was growing up was go outside and don't come back in. And the door was locked and you couldn't get back in all day long. He said, what did you have to drink? You drank out of the water hose. Yeah, and it tastes like rubber. No telling what kind of chemicals were in that stuff back in the day. You drank out of the water hose and then you'd eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich that your mama would give you. And you stayed outside barefooted all day and you survived. You got hot and you stayed under the trees. Time out. Time out was you wait a minute here, let me get my belt off. <laughs> that was time out. No chasing him for the present seemeth to be joyous. The worst thing about my chasing him when I was growing up was my dad would send me back in his room to wait on him. And I think I know why he did that. I think he did it so he would cool off or he'd beat the living, he'd, he'd probably kill me. He had to cool off so when he punished me, it wasn't out of anger, you know. But man, having to sit back there and wait. He said, you go back there and think about what you did. And no matter how many times you said, I'm sorry, please, please, I don't want the punishment, please, please, I'll stop, I'll stop. That might work with mama, but it didn't work with daddy. Bend over. And I learned one thing about chastening. The closer you got, the less it hurt. So if you stay far off, man, he could get that belt. And he had the, his belt had holes all throughout it. I don't know, them old-timey belts, you know, they, just, they were riddled with holes. And that was a good whipping belt because, man, when that thing came through the air, the air just went right through it. That thing went whoosh. And uh, the further you are out away from him, the more leverage he had, and you get hit with the end of that thing, whoo, it would light you up. But you get in close, it's harder for him to get, a, get on you there. <laughs> so you grab a hold of his legs and you scream, you scream, Daddy, no, Daddy, no, Daddy, no. <laughs> and then when it gets on the legs, ouch, especially if you're wearing short pants. Mm. But here's the thing, you get closer, it's not as bad. And as children of God, when the Lord punishes us, we are to get closer. And he wants to draw us closer. So the idea in verse number 11 is it's not joyous. So when you're chastened by the Lord, when he's having to whip you, when he's doing things in your life as a father, it's because he loves you, it's because you are his child, and it's not supposed to be joyous. We've gotten this modern prosperity gospel idea, Joel Osteen, every day is a Friday, that we're always supposed to be walking around and everything's always perfect as a Christian. No, it's not always perfect. Sometimes you are in trouble with the Lord because you did wrong and you're supposed to feel guilty. You're supposed to feel wrong. And sometimes the Lord chastens you to get your attention and it's not supposed to be a fun exercise. It's grievous, but notice verse 11. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. There's a cleansing and a clearing that takes place with chast chastening. There's a cleansing away knowing that you've been punished and you've been corrected. The idea is to be corrected. You're going down the road and you're going off the road, you correct. And chastening corrects us. It makes us what we're supposed to be. So afterward, it's not good while you're being corrected. While all of your faults are pointed out, do you know what you did? No, please enlighten me. Okay, I'm about to tell you what you did. Then you're going to have to take the punishment three weeks, whatever the punishment may be. And then you are, hopefully, afterward, you learn a lesson so you don't take the car when you're only 14 years old and nobody's home and go riding down the road. Amen. Just saying. Amen? You learn your lesson. Finally, I'd like us to go to Luke chapter 15. We'll close with this one. Luke chapter 15. You know the story, so we won't read the entire thing. But here in Luke chapter 15, we have the story of the prodigal son. And you know how that the man had two sons, and the younger son, he wanted to go ahead and get his inheritance. He says, just go ahead and give me what's coming to me. And 
And so the father, he obliges his son, he does that, and then the son takes all of his inheritance, all the money, he goes off and he squanders, squanders it away. He blows it, he wastes it, he goes to the far country, he leaves that, that country life and wants to go to the city. The city's always exciting, right? And he goes and wastes everything. And, but the great part about the story of the prodigal son is not really the story of the prodigal at all. To me, it's the story of the father, which I really believe is a type picture of God. And Jesus, I believe, is telling us this great story to illustrate how God is a good father. Because here in the passage, we have this son that goes off and squanders his inheritance, which was given to him by the father. And he basically comes to nothing. He blows everything. And he comes to himself and he says, I'm just going to go back and apologize and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and thy side. Just make me a servant. I'll just be one of your servants. I'll just work here on the farm. But the father, when he sees him a long way off, he's been looking for him every day. The father's been looking for him. He runs to meet him. And here's my point. My point is he welcomes him home. That's a good father. Thank God that he has all of these, these wishes and dreams for us. Thank God that he sees things that we may be. He sees potential in us. Thank God that he warns us of bad things that could happen in our life. And he, he thought enough about us to give us instructions. He thought enough about us to warn us of the danger that's around the corner. And thank God he loves us enough to whip us. To even make it to where it's a possibility of him doing these things, we could even turn on him. It's a possibility when he whips us that we get bitter at that and we, we might run from it. He takes that risk because he loves us that much. But thank God when we come to our senses and we're ready and willing to get close to God and come back to him, thank God he welcomes us back. He's not like some of the Pharisees and some of the Pharisaical churches I'm sure you've heard of and maybe even know of some people that are this way. Where when somebody comes back to church after a long time, like, what are you doing here? We don't want you here. You done wasted your time. Or maybe somebody that's in a family and they've made some bad choices and bad decisions and then Thanksgiving dinner comes around and they're like, you're not welcome in this house. You broke your mama's heart or you did this or you did that. We've drawn, we've already dis... You say, what do you see? You see forgiveness with the Father. I'm glad God is a forgiving Father. Because I know I have needed His forgiveness more times than not. I've been away and had to come home more times than not. I have squandered my inheritance and wasted my time and been out more times than not. I've not taken heed to the warnings and his dreams and wishes for my life. I've maybe not even given heed to the correction in, in my life. And he still takes me back. Thank God for a good father. You know, the idea of the father in verse number 20, the Bible says he ran and fell on his neck. That's not a normal type of thing for someone, especially back in this time, to do because they had certain protocol. For a father to pull up and back then, thank God we're not in that time, men wore skirts. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not in Bible times. Amen. He pulled up his, his garments and he ran to meet his son. He wasn't the dignified leader and the dignified master of the household at that point. He's a father to a son and he runs to meet him. The idea is just get close and the father will run toward you. There was a uh, preacher preaching on the story of the prodigal son and one of these pharisaical type of uh, people that can't forgive, the ones I mentioned earlier, you know, well you did this and I've done cut you off, I put you on my list and you know, a spirit of unforgiveness is worse to me than a lot of the sins of the flesh. A thing is a deep root of bitterness, and it will destroy you and those around you. And this man, he was that way, and the guy preached on the prodigal son, you know, and he preached along these lines of forgiveness, and, and the father welcomed him back in. And after it was all over, um, the, the guy came to the preacher and says, that was a horrible message. He says, what do you mean that was a horrible message? 
He says, well, he says, I think that story overall was morally irresponsible. He said, well, what would you have done if you were the father? He said, well, I would have called the cops and had him arrested. <laughs> and the preacher said, well, it's a good thing you ain't God. <laughs> I'm glad our heavenly father is a good father. But I'm also glad he's a welcoming father. The, the prodigal already lost everything. And he doesn't get his inheritance back. And by the way, God is a just God and he's a fair God. You don't have to think that God's going to err on the side of being morally irresponsible. Because there is a judgment seat of Christ. And you can lose some rewards and you can lose and squander away your inheritance. But as far as you and as far as fellowship with God is concerned... He will forgive you and he will take you back in. He is a good heavenly father. A Sunday school teacher asked her class who was, who was sorry when the prodigal son returned. Of course, you're thinking the elder brother. And the little boy replied, the fatted calf. <laughs> Don't be an elder brother. Let's have the attitude of the father here. I'm glad God is a good, good heavenly father. One more passage I'd like to read, and I'll close with an illustration. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, when Paul talks about separation, he, he does it with the idea of a father-son relationship. And so he talks about the fact that we're children of God, not children of darkness. We're sons of, of God, not sons of Belial. And we're not supposed to live a certain way because we are believers. And he says this, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. The idea is there are things that we can do as children to damage that relationship between us and the Father. And so coming out from things that displease the Father, coming out from things that cause friction between us and the Lord, that can help us in our relationship with Him. I'm glad the Lord's always ready to take us back. I don't care how many times you mess up. Remember Peter when he said, How many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? <laughs> and the Lord said, Seventy times seven. Over and over and over and over and over, God says, if you mean it, if you confess and forsake, I'll have mercy. And he forgives us and he takes us back. There was a uh, father of a young man back in the time of northern aggression, back in the Civil War time, where the, uh, back, back in that day where a young son had actually up north, he wanted to volunteer and go fight. And he was a little bit young, and his father's like, you don't need to do this. I don't want you to go. You need to stay on the farm and work. Against his father's wishes, he went and signed up, and he went off the battle. Well, several months had passed, and the, the uh, south had pushed up a little bit as you got a little further. And they eventually got closer to some territories and areas that were closer to where the old man had lived, where the old farm was. And he knew there was a bad battle. And a bad, bad war uh, in the Civil War going on. And he wanted to go down and see if he could find out how his son was. He had heard the reports. So he went down and he met with the captain, the general, and began to talk to him and plead with him. They're like, look, you don't need to be here. You need to go. We've had a lot of casualties. A lot of young men have died. The battlefield is just riddled with, with groaning bodies. It was the sun was beginning to set. It was toward evening time and he had his lanterns and stuff and he said, please let me go look for my son. Let me go look for my son. And so they yielded to him and let him go and he got his lanterns. He began to walk through those fields and he, he set out a way that he was just going to kind of zigzag across the field so he can try to cover as much territory. Minutes and hours passed and he kept going through. John Smith, John Smith calling out. This, and all the groans. Eventually he found his son, and of course his son said, Father, I, you know, it was just a great, time, great thing, you know, thank you for coming, and he was able to amend. But the part of the story that intrigued me was as he was walking through, John Smith, this is your father, John Smith, this is your father, there were several men that were saying, reported as saying, I wish that were my father. 
You think about God, He's your Father. And He's looking for you. And He's looking at your best interest in mind. And He knows you by name. If you're saved by God's grace, you belong to Him. You have your special relationship with your Father. And nobody else has that. He's your Heavenly Father. And He cares for you in a way that you can't even imagine. Don't mistake some of the correction and don't mistake some of the warnings and some of the harshness that seems like. Don't mistake the conscience that bears witness to the Bible and, and rebukes you. Don't mistake that for God being mean. Realize God loves you and He's trying to draw you closer to Him. And He will help you. He will forgive you. He will encourage you. He is a good Heavenly Father. Don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't faint. Don't quit. Don't feel like you're forsaken. You're laying out on the battlefield and you're all beat up and bloodied up and maybe because of mistakes that you made. Maybe because you said, I'm going to leave and I want to go fight and I want to go do this. This is my life. These are the things I want to do. And there you are and you look and you see how it turned out. You know, most of the time when we do things our own way, it doesn't turn out too good. And the Lord sees us laying there on the battlefield. And he walks by and he wants to help you because he's a good God. He will never leave you nor forsake you. I don't care how far you've gone astray. You can't get too far from the Father's voice because he cares for you. I'm glad we have a good Heavenly Father. And for all you fathers today, happy Father's Day. I hope you have a good day. and I hope you can... Uh, just reflect on some things, being a father and being a dad. But as a Christian, we can all be thankful that we have a father that is impeccable in his character. Always only does the things that are right and good. What's the old show some of y'all grew up watching? Father Knows Best. Father Knows Best. He does. And we can entrust our lives to our Heavenly Father. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the verses and the scriptures that present the correct theology about who you are and how you relate to us as a father. Lord, I'm so glad that you're a good Heavenly Father. And Lord, though sometimes we go astray and oftentimes we go astray and we get out of the plan that you have for us, God, I pray that you might help us to understand the reasons that we might not even understand at the moment but you're trying to draw us back to yourself. And the chastening and the correction and the warnings, Lord, they're all designed for, designed for your purpose and for our profit. And God, I pray that you might remind us of these things, that we can realize that you're a good father. And I pray for anyone here that maybe they're astray in their own personal life. Lord, maybe as a Christian they have not been taking heed to the warnings. Maybe they've been doing things they shouldn't do and... God, I pray that your Holy Spirit may convict them, that they may realize they can come back home, they can find forgiveness at the foot of the cross. Lord, I pray that we'd understand that though we may go off like the prodigal son and squander our inheritance and waste our substance on righteous living and just come to the end of ourselves, Lord, you're there. Lord, we thank you that you forgive us, that you clothe us, that you put shoes on our feet, that you rejoice that we come home. God, I pray for those that may be astray. I pray for our fathers in here that you might encourage them, help them to continue to be a good father and grandfather to their kids, grandkids, and set those examples that are to be made and set. And I pray, Lord, that you may get glory out of our lives as we try to carry out the wishes of our Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and being so good to us. I pray that you might bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for coming this morning. You are dismissed.